everybody. All right, let's get let's get going. So we got a couple more things to 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 finish up here. So last two things we want to talk about is pheochromocytoma and talk a little bit about some other syndromes uh, associated with hormonal deficiency. So you guys kind of know about pheochromocytoma. Um, it's a disease of the sympathetic nervous system. It's a tumor of the sympathetic nervous system. We remember the rule of 10% because it kind of reminds us of a couple of things about um, what to expect from it. So, so what's this? What's this ten percent business? What's this? What's ten percent? Ten percent are malignant. All right. Ten percent are extra adrenal. Right. That's what you meant. Good. So, ten percent are in kids. Ten percent are bilateral. Ten percent recur. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, very good. So we tend to think of the typical crisis where people kind of get up off the sitting position, they're in the bathroom or something like that, and then they get up and they get this hypertension crisis all of a sudden, right, and, and so forth. And that's the typical crisis, right? They get the flushing and all that, but that's only for 40% of the time. 60% of the time, these patients have stable, severe hypertension. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, remember, is a counter-regulatory hormone. See, the episodic type is the typical one we read in the books. But that, it, you know, they say... They say typical, but it's not so typical because that's why I'm telling you 60% don't have that. They have the, the stable, severe hypertension. Okay? Now, Suzanne said 10% are not associated with hypertension because it's not picked up, but the hypertension is probably there, Suzanne. It's episodic. Okay? All right, now you guys know about this, right? Hyperglycemia, because it's a counter-regulatory hormone. Okay, very good. All right, so still the king in terms of diagnosis of pheochromocytoma are the urine tests. So you're going to base most of your stuff on the urine tests, okay? So the free catecholamines, the metanephrines, the VMAs, right? Free catecholamines in the urine seem to be the most specific test, okay? And now what people have been doing over the last four to five years is they combine them. So I'm going to put a, a plus here with blood tests, right? So now they measure blood metanephrines blood VMAs, and so forth. Everybody okay with that? So they say, okay, let me increase my sensitivity that way, right? So you, you go to places where they really know how to work up pheochromocytoma, they combine both of these. But what did I say is the most important test? The urine tests, right? The urine tests are the most important. So listen, please be very careful. Remember what we said a couple of days ago about endocrine tests. Don't go to imaging unless you show evidence of endocrine abnormalities. All right, please do not get imaging of the adrenals unless you have something from the urine or the blood say look it looks like a pheochromocytoma everybody understand that so i've been to i've been to uh, a morbidity and mortality conference
conferences where uh, people have presented cases of patients where they've taken out their adrenals based on an MRI result with the urine test and the blood test being normal. Yeah, that's not good. That is not good. You know, medicine doesn't get a point for that. We get in trouble. All right, so please be careful because, you know, because people don't listen. Because people think, you know, that they could, they could uh, look at a, at a CAT scan or an MRI, find some kind of lesion in the adrenals, and speculate that that's a pheochromocytoma. Right? I told you, you have to have evidence of an endocrine problem. You have to have hormonal biochemical abnormalities. Okay? Everybody okay with that? So please, do not go any further without the urine test being positive or the blood test. If the urine test and blood tests are negative, this patient doesn't have feel. Okay? Now, some people, what they do is just to be sure, they repeat them. Right. So, Suzanne said, imaging is the last test in endocrine disease and only go to it if the, we show endocrine and biochemically that there's a lesion. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Very, very important. And then, then, then once you, you, you find it biochemically, okay, now you can localize it with an MRI. Okay? All right. Remember, this is a surgical disease. All right? So look at here. Somebody asked me this a couple of months ago. It says, like, what, what, uh, which patients with pheochromocytoma uh, don't you take the surgery? The answer is for you guys, no one. Everybody goes for surgery. <clears throat> Pheochromocytoma causes devastating problems if left untreated. Strokes, heart failure. So this stuff that Suzanne was talking about before, where it's not picked up, and these guys present with, with strokes because, you know, nobody's picked it up. So it has to be taken out. Okay? It has to be taken out. All right, so they may ask you guys, what do you do before? What's the answer? You can't go and take them to surgery. You know, the surgeon starts fooling around with the feel, and, you know, they take it out laparoscopically now. But if you take it out, right, you get a, a big surge of epi and norepinephrine, and they get, they get a hypertensive crisis, right? So what do you got to do? You alpha block them, alpha block them, alpha block them, alpha block them. Like drugs like what? Phenoxybenzamine, phentolamine, right? All right, everybody okay with that? So Amanda's had a great question. So I've seen a field chromocytoma. Remember 10% are extra adrenal, right? Extra adrenal. So I saw one at the base of the skull. So this guy said no. I'd rather stroke out. Nobody's going to go open my brain out, right? So what do you do in that case? So that's the rare cases where you can't take the surgery, right? Now you, you alpha block them indefinitely, right? But even those patients, you know, have a problem. Tough. That's right. Very tough. Be careful about beta blockers. Do you guys know what happens if you give these guys beta blockers? So I had a young student one time come in, and she had high blood pressure but not the typical feel and the resident put her on a beta blocker right and then her mother calls me three days later and said doctor I don't know where you got your medical degree but you know you gave a medication for my blood for, for my daughter's blood pressure to come down and her blood pressure went from 170 to 210 what do you guys think about that on the post alpha receptors, right? So we don't give other antihypertensives, right? So be careful if you see a paradoxical response to a blood pressure medication, you need to think about pheochromocytoma. What did I just say? If you see a paradoxical response to an antihypertensive medication, you need to think about pheochromocytoma. Okay? Everybody clear on that? So be careful here about the alpha blockers. Alpha blockers, alpha blockers, don't give them anything else. Okay. 
All right, very good. All right, last thing, and then we got our, we want to talk about GI. All right, so hypogonadism, I want to talk about two diseases. No, no, I don't care. Arrestive said about selective beta blockers. No, no, just trust me. There's no such thing as they're selective. They're more selective beta blockers, but none of them are totally selective. Okay? That's right. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Now, now listen, somebody I know, uh, uh, so, so listen, it, in all reality, so let me tell you about this case I had with the student that I just talked to you about. So I put her on alpha blockers and she was going to go for surgery. Right, so we alpha blocked her, alpha blocked her, alpha blocked her, got her blood pressure under control and stuff like that. And she was going to surgery in about a week. And she called me and says, listen, you know, I, you know, my blood pressure is, is perfectly normal now after you guys gave me phenoxybenzamine, but, but I'm, I'm getting palpitations all the time, you know, and tachycardia and stuff like that, and I can't sleep at night. So if the blood pressure, you guys don't have to know this, so if the blood pressure is stable, if the blood pressure is stable, right, and you've controlled it with alpha blockers and it's totally stable, then you could add a little bit of a beta blocker to control the tachycardia. But please don't give beta blockers with the alpha blockers in the beginning or beta blockers before the alpha. Okay? Everybody okay with that? All right, beautiful. All right, last two diseases. All right, you guys are, you guys are doing great. So primary hypogonadism. All right, the disease we want to know, the one that we got in your notes and you guys need to know is Klinefelter syndrome. So this is the most common cause of primary, primary hypogonadism. In fact, it's probably the most common form of hypogonadism that we see as a disease. So in some parts of the world, one in 300, one in 400, one in 500 pregnancies, you have a case of Klinefelter. So, so it's relatively common. As you all know, it's an extra X chromosome. So these guys look like they're men, right, with an extra X chromosome. A single extra X chromosome makes about 80% of the cases. What's the other 20%? What's the other 20%? No, not, not two Ys. Mosaic, right, or three Xs, right? There you go. So you got a mosaic is, you know, XXY plus XXXY and stuff like that. More X's. That's the rest of the 20%. The more X's you have, guess what? What do you have more of? If you have more X's, what do you have more of? Well, that makes sense, right? More X's, right, make more hypogonadism. Right? Everybody understand that? Infertility, hypogonadism, the features are more significant in that case. These patients present with gynecomastia and small testes. And I just met, mentioned, as the X's increase, the, this, these features get worse, more severe hypogonadism. The primary problem when you have an extra X chromosome is in the production of testosterone, right? So I'm going to circle that. That's where the lesion is, right down here, right? You don't produce testosterone. So what does that do? Now you got a positive feedback and you increase your luteinizing har hormone and your FSH even, even in men, right? But primarily your LH right and then all the way up in the hypothalamus good Denise said there you go all the way up here right your GnRH go up all right so if I wanted to see what this guy had if he has got Klinefelters well I could do for I could look for bar bodies I could do chromosomal analysis but I could also measure hormones chromosomal analysis is very common and easy to do now okay so low testosterone revs up your LHFSH, revs up your gonadotropin releasing hormone. Everybody okay with that? Okay, very good. What's the treatment? Well, they're missing testosterone, so we give them testosterone. Once we give them testosterone, 
the features all become, you know, improve. The hormone levels go down. FSH, LH go down, gonadotropin releasing hormone go down, testosterone goes up. Okay, you guys have to know this right here. All right, these patients, remember, 2% maybe of breast cancer occurs in men. 98% occurs in women, but there's a small percent, maybe 2%, maybe less than that, that occurs in men. All right, people with Klinefelter syndrome are 20 times more at risk than normal men in terms of getting breast cancer. So some people say, look, make sure you do a good physical exam, a breast exam on them every year. And some people say even consider doing a mammogram. Okay? Everybody okay with that? So it's not testicular cancer. I know some of you think it's testicular cancer that they're at risk for. It's breast cancer, all right? So if they give you five choices, which of these men is a higher risk of getting breast cancer? So you're like, wait a second, women get breast cancer, but that's, they're asking about that small percent. They're talking about Klinefelters, okay? No, that's a great question, Kayer. So they don't, it, so even if they get testosterone replacement, right, their risk of breast cancer is very high, okay, still despite that. Okay? Everybody okay with that? All right, so now let's do the last syndrome. So now this is secondary. So so people feel that anything where the problem is above the testes, right, is considered secondary. So they lump they lump pituitary and and uh, you know, anything above the pituitary in secondary forms of hypogonadism. Right? So you have the syndrome. Now look at this. Follow the hormones now where GnRH is, there's a single defect in the production of GnRH, right? This causes a decrease in LH, FSH, and all that, and at the same time causes a decrease in production of testosterone. So you remember, remember how the, the levels were before, right? So this is a little different, right? So now the, the end result is the same. You've got low testosterone, so that's why you have, you have hypogonadism because of the low testosterone, right? But you could follow the hormones here. The, it starts off differently. It starts from the hypothalamus, affects the pituitary, and the testes, right? Everybody okay with that? So this is a single defect. It's X-linked, single gene defect. So these patients, once you have this defect, you don't produce testosterone, well, you got gynecomastia, small testes. The only difference between this and Klinefelter syndrome, look, FSH and LH is low here, right? That's how you could tell the difference. Now this interesting disease, this interesting disease has one more problem. They develop anosmia. They don't develop it, they have it. So, you know, they tell you they can't smell anything all the time. I had a friend like that, right? And this guy, he couldn't smell anything. So, this anosmia doesn't go away when you treat these patients. You know, it's a defect that stays, okay? So if they got a low testosterone, how do we treat it? Well, one option is to give them testosterone, right? The other thing is now there's a synthetic, I don't know if you guys could see this here, synthetic GnRH. That's what a lot of people use. They like that. So they're saying, you're missing this? I'll give you that. It's a little bit more costly, but it kind of normalizes everything. Right? So either some kind of lupulide derivative or something like that, GnRH, there's other ones too, or testosterone. Either one works well. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay, very good. All right, let's go forward. All right, so you guys are done now with all your, your endocrinology. All right, we've gone through 
a lot, a lot of stuff in endocrinology. All right, so now we want to move forward and we want to talk about gastroenterology. No, uh, Kalman syndrome does not have a risk for breast cancer, only Kleinfelters. Uh, well, listen, but you guys, if you know this stuff about endocrinology, you know 90 plus percent of the stuff that they're going to put on the USMLE, and, and you should feel good about it, okay? Okay, so Eddie said, how about violence in Kleinfelters? You know, so there's these old reports that people said that